Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Hi, you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Phase World Podcast. This one is a mini episode of Phase World, only 30 minutes, but it's your precious time. So I thank you for joining us. Today on Face World, I would like to welcome a very special young man. His name is Matthew Cronin. He is 21 years old and is currently majoring in foreign policy at Boston University. He's graduating this May 2016. He and I met at Inna's Kitchen in Newton, Massachusetts, where he works part time. Through a very casual conversation over a year ago, I found out that Matthew would be studying abroad in the Middle East. I couldn't wait for his return to find out more about his experience, so he finally came back, and here it is, our podcast together. Surprise! So studying abroad was not part of Matthew's major requirement, but he chose a path to learn more about the Middle East through the people and culture. To prepare for his trip, Matthew took extensive courses in learning Arabic, a language he finds artistic and beautiful. In this short 30-minute conversation with Matthew, we discussed his earlier life as a high school dropout before Boston University and his experience learning and practicing Arabic. I was most interested in his trip to the Middle East, so Matthew shares his first impressions in Jordan and Morocco. Getting to know the people in the Middle East is quite interesting, a system of what's referred to as a high contact society in a system with no system. So unlike living in New England, you will not get away with not talking to anyone throughout the whole day. The high contact society requires that you communicate with each other throughout the day. Studying abroad in the Middle East and a social life away from home was a little bit different than what Matthew expected. On that note, he shares real life skills for immigrants, travelers, and students from place A to B. As a result of interviewing Matthew, I discovered a a growing appreciation for social networks and human connections. And our conversations also triggered so many thoughts and memories of me as a 16-year-old coming to the United States. If you are a student who's looking to transition from school to work, Face World may be able to help. Check out our services at fromschooltowork.com. Phase World helps students maximize the chance of getting what they want, close the gap between school and the real world, and also owning a concrete strategy and a plan of action. I would like to welcome Matthew Cronin to the Phase World podcast. And thank you so much for listening. I will see you at the end of the show. I'm here with Matt inside the Newton Free Library, one of my favorite libraries in the in the world. Mm-hmm. Not that I've been to so many, but we had a we had a tour just now looking for a study room <laughs> and found the smallest one possible. We got good exercise and it's quite warm. Yeah, here yeah. we are. Yeah, here we are. So, so Matt, one of the reasons for for me to be so interested in chatting with you is because you work part time at my favorite. Uh, diner slash kitchen in this kitchen and Ina herself has been on my podcast at the very beginning oh, she? yeah she oh. was like first five six episodes really hmm. did you get food on there too just make sounds of food and make sounds of you eating their delicious food I wish I did we recorded that uh, when the kitchen was closing down around like 2 uh-huh yeah it was actually not a great idea because the sound, because <laughs> the, the the mic was picking up all these kitchen sounds and the dishes yeah drop sweeping on the floor. and cleaning the grill. It's not a lovely sound. And yet, <laughs> the cooking sounds a little bit better than the cleaning. So true. Not the cleaning up sound. Right. Yeah. So you so you work there. I feel like we periodically had these conversations about your to me slightly unusual path for mm-hmm. a college student. Yeah. You've been around the world, and so so part of it. <laughs> it's big. Yeah, so tell us a little bit uh, about you, your sort of 
your name, your age, if you don't mind exposing, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's not a big exposure. Okay, uh, and where are you going to school? Uh, so I am 21. My name is Brennan. I go to Boston University. I've been there for um, about a year and a half now, maybe a little more. I study the Middle East, and I've spent the last year in Jordan and Morocco, uh, learning Arabic and sort of the politics of the Middle East, and mm -hmm. gotten to been fortunate enough to travel around that region and um, Eastern Europe as well. Nice. Wow. So you've been that. That's interesting. You've been at BU for only a little bit over mm -hmm. a year, year and a half. And yeah. you spent the past year in yeah, the yeah. Middle East. Like, how, how did that come about? Uh, what In terms of my interest in the Middle East, the timing? Pretty or... much everything. Why why were you there? And what, mm. what brought you there in the first place? Okay. Uh, so a little background story. I, um, I had dropped out of high school. I actually, I'm not a high school graduate. So maybe that's a little more um, spice in the story. I don't know. Um, I left high school about 75% of the way through my freshman year. Um, and then I, I was working sort of menial day jobs um, throughout my, my mid middle teens. Well, I was 15, 16, 17. Um, and I had um, sort of... Uh, had a midlife crisis, though hopefully not a midlife crisis, because that would mean I would die at 30. <laughs> um, so hopefully I live a little longer. Uh, but I, I sort of was searching for purpose in life. And I, I remember very specifically, I was watching 60 Minutes and this story by Laura Logan, who's a very great reporter on the Middle East, came up and talking about the, the war in Syria. And this was about uh, a year into the war, a year after the Arab Spring started. And this picture came on, and it was, I mean, excuse the gory details, but it was a picture of um, people uh, in Damascus who had been beheaded and their bodies just tossed into a river. Mm -hmm. And in the context of my sort of existential wanderings that I had spent all day doing while I was working my menial day jobs, um, this picture really struck me, and I decided that, um, you know, if I could, I you know, being in a place like... Uh, Massachusetts, you see a lot of very sort of uh, relatively affluent people living um, very comfortable lives. And I, I, I sort of came to this fork where I said, well, I could pursue that very comfortable life or I could um, confront this image in front of me, literally this image and this image of this horrible war going on in Syria and um, use my opportunity of, you know, the privileges of being an American, having great access to ed fantastic education and all these resources around us to do something about that. Um, and I chose the latter path, and that's sort of how I got into all this. So between the age of 15, 16, until 21, yeah. there, there are, you know, a bunch of years in between. And yes. So from that decision, oh, first of all, what, what was the job you were at what, when this was happening in your <laughs> mid-teens? <laughs> uh, I think at that point I was changing oil at a Jiffy Lube. <laughs> so. I think a lot of what we do in life, it's kind of, you know, back to your point, for mm. convenience. Yeah. And I think yeah, living yeah. in this country, um, we don't often think about mm -hmm. the pr privilege. I mean, just looking at the water we're drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's so many parts yeah. of the world. And I, I was, um, I think it was called Slingshot. Recently, I got really into documentaries and mm -hmm. um, this guy who invented this like pure water filter that's, yeah. in, you know, industrial level, but it's, and then you try to kind of break it down, just like invent the invention of an iPhone, make it smaller and mm -hmm. smaller and mm -hmm. be able to ship to mm -hmm. parts of Africa, India, and yeah. well, teach people how to use it, yeah. produce clean water. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really amazing for somebody like yourself at uh, the age of, I mean, I came to the realization more so in my mid to late 20s to say, what can I do for mm -hmm. the people around me? Not even to say like mm -hmm. countries a, a, apart mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. US. So you're 15, 16. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that transition in the next three to four years. Where has your life taken you to places that kind of begin to fulfill or to actually help answer some of the questions that you had at the time? Mm, um, well, I, I mean, it, a lot of it was just a lot of, and it has been over the past five years, legwork in sort of terms of education. Um, there's a lot to jump through and going from, you know, high school dropout to uh, Boston University was, um, you know, a lot of community college and things like this. And, um, um, Within the last year and a half, I've um, taken up the task of learning Arabic, which is 
um, something, a whole nother journey in itself, yeah. quite, uh, quite the challenge, uh, but a welcome challenge because it's, um, you know, it's not something that uh, a lot of people know and that makes it quite the asset for anyone who um, wishes to learn it. And it's actually kind of a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I, I know it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's very artistic and the language itself is um, quite beautiful to look at and um, the system uh, on which the language is based it's based on this very interesting root system where you take um, three letters and uh, basically can contort those letters in a set number of patterns um, to make different meanings and uh, it's just sort of a fascinating intellectual um, challenge sort of having to uh, you, you you take a word and then you break it down through those um, uh, into those roots and then you look at the pattern that's used applied to that root and you can sort of figure mm -hmm. out the meaning that way so it's a constant puzzle and um, very entertaining um, so wow, th three letters. Three, three letters. All the words. Three letters. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of the permutations. I was a math major. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't possibly think of using yeah. three letters or create a language. Yeah. Well, it's not. Uh, there, there are more than three letters. The language has many more than three letters. Mm -hmm. But the point is that um, there are um, three-letter roots, right? Mm -hmm. And those roots have a root meaning, mm -hmm. right? And then you apply a series of patterns to those three letter roots to sort of um, shift the meaning slightly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to, um, uh, the, the three letter root khalasa uh, means to finish. In uh, the Derija dialect, that means to pay, which is sort of like to finish a transaction, right? Mm -hmm. So you take this very basic meaning and then you mutate it in uh, set ways and you come to a slightly different meaning. Wow. Yeah. How long did it take for you to learn from first lesson number one? Ooh. Oh my goodness. And then to when you, I mean, how, how long did it take for you to feel comfortable with languages, just like the conversation that we're having now, without mm. talking too much about politics and all, kind mm -hmm. of just a casual yeah. conversation? Did you have anyone to even practice with? What? In Arabic? Um, so th the first thing is that I've been studying it for a year and a half, and the Arabic takes much longer than that to learn. Um, most people will say, you know, five years if you're really dedicated to it. Wow. So, um, I'm shocked that I'm even at this point, you know, in the first class you're, you're learning the letters and you have to learn the whole alphabet, you know, it, it's, um, a completely different alphabet. And, you know, before I took that first class a year and a half ago, it looked like a bunch of squiggly lines, which mm -hmm. is exactly what it looks like to everyone else. And mm -hmm. <laughs> honestly, sometimes I still think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you you break into it in pieces and there are days where it's really frustrating because you'll you know watch a film and i still don't understand you know 95 percent of it and then there are days where I'll just things will just click mm. um and that's really what language learning is about it's about putting in a lot of time and um uh, sort of committing yourself and you mentioned speaking to people mm -hmm. um that's a big part of it and that's why i've been over to jordan and morocco and um you really start to engage with people. And the good thing is that um, people in the Arab world are A, extraordinarily friendly, not mm -hmm. to generalize, but it's true, and B, um, very interested and um, enthusiastic that there are um, Westerners willing to come over and learn Arabic. So they're willing to help with you. You sit down with a taxi driver, he's taking you to school, and he'll teach you five new words. Oh and, uh, that's how they do it. It's great, it's great fun, uh, great learning experience, yeah. Wow. So... I, I do want to kind of get into your travel mm. in the Middle East because mm. that intrigued me. Yeah. Um, how did your parents react to kind yeah. of this decision, this path in general? Like, they do they get it? Do they mm. support it? Uh, yeah. I. Um, oh, part of that probably comes from um, my um, my being very stubborn. Um, it was sort of not a question with my parents. It was sort of a statement, Mom, I'm going to study the Middle yeah. East. I'm telling you bye this. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, they have been very understanding. Of course, there's a lot of friends I have who um, study the same thing as me. And, you know, I've heard stories about how their parents were very unhappy about what they chose to study. And um, obviously people have very... Um, very large hurdles when it mm -hmm. comes to understanding the Middle East mm -hmm. because we have this whole generation 
of sort of baby boomers who grew up understanding the Middle East as oil crises and um, wars and uh, the Iranian revolution and the CIA intrigue. Mm -hmm. And you go over to the Middle East and there are people, there are mm -hmm. millions and millions of just human beings, mm -hmm. just human beings living their lives and lovely human beings at that. And you can, um, I mean, there are signs of sort of that very uh, militaristic uh, conception that we in America usually carry of the Middle East. You, you walk through a place like Jordan and because of security, there are um, gendarm, gendarmery forces with um, quite large automatic rifles walking mm, around. Wow. But you can forget about that too. That, mm. that, that doesn't have to be there and you, um, this, is, this, is a, this is a place where people live. Right? Yeah. And there are people there. It's amazing because I, I tell people all the time, as you know, I'm mm -hmm. originally from Beijing, China. Mm -hmm. And I don't know through our sporadic conversation how much of those stories have you been able yeah. to piece together. Yeah. Now, I came here when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the same. It, it's interesting. The same time that you kind of had this like intriguing thoughts of a, what is it like on the other side of the world? Yeah. Is it true what I learned in books and watch right, on TV, right, right. what I heard from my parents, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I always tell my friends, and then they tell me the same thing, especially after they travel to China, they start to think that, wow, it's, there are people and they mm -hmm. so much, we share so much in common. And it's, it's interesting, some of my friends were kind of afraid of the, the Chinese military and they were thinking, just being white, being Caucasian, it, would it be arrested? I mean, they, they yeah. asked me questions, really, like, would really. it be arrested on the street? Of course not. Mm -hmm. um, people are very interested, and especially when foreigners, in particular Americans, like mm -hmm. Chinese people really just find American people very mesmerizing on so mm -hmm. many levels, and we yeah. can talk about why, and it's just a free spirit and mm -hmm. the ability to love the world, to, mm -hmm to accept others. Yeah. Um, but I love the fact that you're seeing that in particular, I think maybe it's e easier for American to travel to Asia and, mm -hmm. you know, um, but to the Middle East is a place where, especially given the current politics, a lot of people are afraid to even talk about it, mm -hmm. to, uh, to even react or respond. And yet you put yourself physically there. Mm -hmm. So do you remember, I'm sure you do, do you remember preparing for the trip and literally tell me about your travel? Like when you, when you, how long did it take to get to Jordan? I believe that was your mm -hmm. first destination. Mm -hmm. And what was your first impression of it? What are some of the events and that you 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 feel like you'll never forget, mm. possibly? Mm. Well, it takes a long time to get there. I'll say that <laughs> first. Um, it's um, let's see. When I first arrived, um, the first thing you notice is definitely the call to prayer. You get off um, and. You know, no matter what time of day, because it happens five times a day, you hear it, and that that mm -hmm. sort of hits you, and that is sort of uh, a lightning rod symbol, I think, for anyone going into the Middle East, because it's it reverberates throughout the city in this very very gorgeous melodic way, and it is sort of the ever present symbol of Islam to the Muslim him or herself or the foreigner. It's a, it's a constant reminder of the presence of religion in society that just does not exist, especially in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect that was most startling to me upon arrival was just sort of the, I don't want to use the word chaos because that's definitely a loaded word with um, a good amount of uh, negative baggage in it, but um, the Middle East depends on where you go. Morocco, especially Jordan, less so, is a system of of no systems. Mm -hmm. So you get there, and um, people, uh, their society functions in a, in what's called a sort of um, high contact society. So that means that um, relationships are paramount. There's no sort of overarching uh, rules. Uh, there are, but the the sort of social organization does not um, uh, base itself on overarching principles and rules. Mm. So that means that to do anything uh, in society is more social in a high context culture. And the Middle East is very, very high context. So that means that road signs are less important. It's more about knowing where you're going based on um, landmarks, based on historical events, or based on just asking someone. 
right? Mm, interesting. So they have they have road signs, but it not, might not even be in the language that the local people understand. It might be in English, and most of the people don't understand English. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, when I first arrived in Jordan, they said, well, <laughs> you're not going to use road signs to tell the taxi driver where to go. You have to know, and you have to explain to him. Yeah. So, um, it's a lot more interacting with people, especially in sort of our Northeast American culture here. Mm -hmm. You can get by a whole day without talking to anyone. Oh, so true. Entirely possible. I do it all the time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. In the Middle East, no, not going to happen. You're going to talk to so many people all the time. Mm -hmm. And that, that hit me right off the bat. It was, um, and people smile a lot too. So you, you come out smiling a lot. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, a you sort of wrapped in this nice warmth of, um, human, uh, human interest. People are interested to talk to you. It's really fun. So almost like, because I, I assume you were born and raised. Yeah. Yeah. I've mm -hmm. lived my whole life in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so you're very conditioned and that what, the way we live here mm -hmm. is very familiar to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure when you will, you know, sort of prepare your trip, read mm -hmm. articles online or got a tourist book or some mm -hmm. sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you show up in the country is completely different than what you imagined. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like even when you're shielded up to say, you know, let me navigate. I have no friends here. I'm just mm -hmm. here by myself. Mm -hmm. And but people are walking up to you to offer you help. Mm -hmm. And do they do that? Do they smile at you to say, hey, are you are you looking to go somewhere? Mm -hmm. You yeah. look lost or mm -hmm. um, do they offer their help automatically? It depends on where you, you are. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the Middle East is big. Um, yeah, yeah. And I only actually went to one country in the Middle East. Morocco is in North Africa, more appropriately mm -hmm. delineated. Um, Morocco is very much like that. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you look lost, um, mm -hmm. someone will probably offer to help you. You ask people on the street and they're going to... They're mm -hmm. gonna give you directions for ten minutes and probably have a conversation. With them. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll offer you food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> I've had that happen. It's good. Yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's um, very ho hospitality is um, a critical part of um, Middle Eastern culture. So mm -hmm. um, you are automatically sort of welcomed, and people are willing to help you yes, for yeah. sure. Um, which is also uh, pertinent to language learning right because if you're in a very high text con high, high context culture excuse me um you have to use language all the time yeah um, so yeah. arabic is difficult to learn but it's easy to practice if you're in the middle east because people are going to talk to you they're very friendly yeah. yeah so what was it like to go to school there i assume mm. were you you know what was the education structure like because i know that study abroad it's some oftentimes very different than the kind of the structure mm -hmm. that you have at bu yeah right so what what was it like how many classes you had and what who are your classmates um well my programs were all sort of um separate from the local university so i actually wasn't taking classes with um, mm -hmm. the local students which was quite unfortunate but my language capability was just nowhere near mm -hmm. um making that possible um but uh so for the most part i was just sort of taking classes with um my my fellow american boston university students mm. yeah. so what was the class size like how uh, so there were smaller programs so a couple of them were you know eight students wow um, nine students ten students um yeah so it was a great experience so i have a feeling and my assumption is because that was the you know, unfortunate setup. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you knew going into it, potentially you did, but then again, the moment you break away from the classes, uh, hopefully that's not nine to five, but you have some breaks in between mm -hmm. and all right, that. Right, right. And did you, I, I, did you proactively seeking out kind of local culture and perhaps leaving your crowd of students like mm -hmm. people you know and kind of making local friends? Did you make friends nearby? Are they writing, thinking of you right now? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in, in both cases, I was living with families. So that was, um, you know, a lot of sort of interaction with um, Jordanians and Moroccans there. Um, the one thing I will say is that, um, you know, you do obviously make efforts to, to make friends uh, your own age in, the, in these places, but um, it's it's incredibly hard to do um mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll um you know be frank about that because you know i, I think that a lot of times especially when you're going over for a very short period of time yeah 
uh, in sort of a non-work setting maybe, mm -hmm. um, you have this sort of romantic concept that you're immediately going to sort of integrate. Mm -hmm. And that's something that takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of work. Because you can say, yeah, uh, Jordanian culture is not that different in theory, right? It's mm -hmm. just people after all. Mm -hmm. um, but, at, you know, once you actually try and make friends with people, you realize that your your social reference points are very, very different, right? So there are things that make us laugh um, mm -hmm. when we when we talk with our friends, right? Maybe we talk about the movies that we like. Maybe we talk about football. Maybe mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? Mm -hmm. And they have this whole other set of yeah. cultural reference points mm -hmm. that they bond on and laugh on. And they're the 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 uh, crossover there is highly limited unless you find a way to um, either a adopt their reference points or b help them adopt your reference points. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes a very active effort, and that's it's so interesting. You just uh, you kind of open up, reopen up a a very early, much earlier chapter of my own life coming oh, yeah? to this country when I was sixteen, mm. and the funny thing was. You know, I was considered very American in Beijing. Okay, and how were your language capabilities? Uh, good question. I was able to speak the language, and people often, even when I first uh, came here, my classmates, my teachers told me that my language skills, it's there. I mean, I was, they thought I was fluent. Okay. But I immediately noticed that some of the terminologies, or even some of the words I chose, mm -hmm. were weird to yeah. local people. Right, right. Um, granted, I went to school in Maine, but let's, let's yeah. just set aside yeah, that joke yeah, yeah. for a second. But, yeah. uh, uh, I definitely struggled, and but moreover, after you get really comfortable with the language, and for me that was quick, very quickly, like six to eight months. I was like, okay, I get this. And right. school subjects at times still very challenging, like creative writing and memorizing like words I would never be able to use again, that sort of thing. But um, I remember the social context, and that in a sense of, you know, I was sixteen, and you hear Chinese parents to say. Oh, it will take you like two weeks to understand everything there is to American culture. And it's not true because no, no. personally, I have no interest in sports mm -hmm. uh, as in watching sports. Right. But on the flip side, I love playing sports. Mm -hmm. So I played ice hockey in, in high school and uh, I'm interested in baseball and all that. But I yeah. don't really like to sit on the couch and pop up in a, a bag of potato chips and just that's not really my uh, the right. way I was conditioned to have fun. Right. Right. Uh, right. So. So that part, I feel like, fast forward 15 years later today, mm -hmm. there's still some things that I struggle with, such as going to work, and my co all my coworkers know this, that I struggle to leave a full day of work and use a local bar as the only way to celebrate and mm -hmm. have a good time. Mm -hmm. And I find that so counterintuitive. One, I'm paying $10 for a mm -hmm. glass of drink yeah. that's worth 50 cents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, secondly, I can absolutely hear nobody. Nobody can hear right. anybody. Right, right, right. Um, and maybe that's why we do it. Then maybe that's <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe maybe that's that's still to me. It's like I still haven't figured it out, and right. Uh, and so I find other ways to to mm -hmm. channel that energy. Yeah. Um, but uh, actually, that's a really interesting. I I didn't think about this. Did you? I mean, you were there for a very limited amount of time. But was there any windows into that potentially things that you find interesting, like American things or activities that you find interesting that local people are like, wait a minute. You know, I know Matthew. Let's let's see how that works out for us. Like, was there any sort of that transition, like you meeting people in the middle and finding something that you could potentially both enjoy, even if it's only for once or twice? You know, it's not like a routine or anything. Mm. I will say, on uh, sort of a, a larger societal level, mm. um, comparing Jordanian and Moroccan culture, Jordanian culture um, has very much, um, especially in Oman the capital, very affluent relative to the rest of the Middle East, has sort of adopted a lot of American cultural mm. um, practices. They have bars where you can watch sports. They have bars where they play football. Mm. I watched uh, the Patriots Super Bowl in, in a bar there. <laughs> um, and there were Jordanians there who have traveled to America who were there watching with me. Um, so in Jordan, it was actually pretty easy because you say you're American and there are people who know what it is because mm -hmm. of our um, long term security relations with Jordan. Jordan um, there's quite a bit of um, cultural 
um, influence that we have there. Um, not, um, it's not uh, infinite, mm -hmm. but there are common reference points so that, um, you know, I felt like, wow, these are things I could be doing back home. Yeah. Um, in Morocco, definitely less so because Morocco was colonized by the French. So the um, sort of foreign Western culture that Morocco has um, taken in is all French. Mm -hmm. So um, if I were a Frenchman, it might be a lot easier. Yeah, interesting. Um, but I am not, alas. And there was much less um, mm. of that sort of American culture, mm. almost none. One one thing I thought about is, like, were you ever scared, and or less so? That's too strong of a word. Uncomfortable, unprepared for certain situations while you were there. Mm. Oh, tough question. Was I unprepared? Um, yes, I think on the topics that we've been hitting so far, um, it's. Um, I I think I was unprepared for how difficult it would be to to culturally integrate and make friends. Mm -hmm. So I think that for anyone who's going abroad um, for extended periods of time and trying to live in um, very different places, you have to be prepared to um, be isolated, be lonely at times, yeah. because it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that maybe you could um, attest to that coming from Beijing at yeah. 16, an especially turbulent time of your life in terms of yeah. sort of social engagement. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that will ring a bell with anyone who has moved out. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's why uh, in, in immigration, uh, bringing families over is so important because when people get isolated, it becomes very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that gave me an appreciation for um, the um, the need to maintain social networks, familiar networks, um, in moving across borders. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So because we're getting kicked out, and this is so <laughs> interesting, by the way, because for I, I didn't quite expect that your one year experience to kind of trigger a lot of memories mm -hmm. from you know uh, for me and. You know, I don't like to ask, oh, what are you going to do in the five, five, next five to ten years? You're very young, and a lot of the doors are open to you, whether you know it or not. Um, what are some of the things beyond graduation? I don't know when the estimated time mm, would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I graduate in May, and I'm cl facing the classic um, graduate dilemma these days of uh, just... Uh, Jobs are limited in the field I'm entering at an entry level. Um, what is that field, by the way? So, really, it's um, foreign policy. I would okay. like to work to the State Department eventually, um, inshallah, hopefully. Um, Child law? Inshallah. Yeah. Oh, was like... Inshallah, that's Arabic. Oh, okay. A little Arabic for you means okay. God willing. Uh -huh. um, something you say for hope for the future. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, I just don't know. So mm -hmm. you'll have to ask me in two, three months. And maybe okay. you'll be able to better answer that question. Yeah. So, you know, this is like also on off a record. Either way, I I remember how difficult that period of um, my life, you know, was uh, even starting at the age of 19, 20. Just like, mm. OK. Right. You know, graduation is What's gonna near. Happen? What's going to happen? Yeah, it's you a know, big precipice. You 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 can see to the end of the cliff, mm -hmm. but you have no idea what comes after that, and it's terrifying. Yeah, and it's really scary. And then I listen to podcasts, talking to people. Now I'm 32. I can confidently tell you that everything is going to be okay. <laughs> and I literally go to restaurants and I see a 20 year old like, "Come here," especially for women. And, you know, mm -hmm. right, like, right, and right. I just want to tell you. Everything's going to be okay, mm. regardless of what you study, what you're into. Right, right, right. Because you don't know that. You don't see that. And you would doubt anybody who will say that to you. Right. And in particular, sometimes parents are not the most helpful people because mm. they, they are anxious for you and they want you to be successful. So as part of the company I'm starting in this year, if I didn't mention I quit my job. Um, oh, did you? Yeah. So oh. I took the leap that, like you did, to go to Middle East and to uh, get myself uncomfortable again and that's not necessarily the word for you but for me to kind of create that friction mm -hmm. and kind of create that friction between what i'm trying to do so i want to help small businesses individuals like the atherton twins and the last category i'm super passionate about is helping students mm -hmm. from i helped a lot of high school students uh kind of my sweet spot but slowly i'm transitioning into college students and then early graduates meaning people like around your age into the 
mid to even late 20s, but mid 20s ish that people are choosing right before this. I was consulting for a student on his website. Mm -hmm. And does he tell the right story? I can just tell how smart he is, but how many questions that he has mm -hmm. on his mind. Just like, is this good enough? Like, do you know how many people even have websites to begin with, um, especially students? So if you have any questions, I'll be I'll be more than happy to kind of help you navigate your career. Granted, I, I claim no expertise in, <laughs> in, in foreign policies mm. and as such. Um, but and I think it will be it will be really interesting where you find yourself uh, doing. All right. Yeah. yeah inshallah, it works out. A little yeah. more Arabic for you there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anything, anything else you feel desperate to to share that I somehow just didn't. We've covered quite a bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Yeah, this is super fun. Yeah, it was. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.